Welcome everyone uh, to Bug Hunt Intro. We used to do uh, an introduction when we met all together and due to COVID, we are unable to meet together in a, in a set a central location in a facility. So we are just all having you all meet out at sites. And so we wanted to offer this um, just to give you a little bit of introduction to uh, what it's like to be at a bug hunt. So this uh, webinar is mainly designed for people who have never done one before. Um, but, but we invited everybody who just wanted to get a refresher. Um, so I am Sally Petrella. I am the monitoring manager at Friends of the Rouge. I've been with Friends of the Rouge uh, going on 21 years overseeing monitoring and more recently working on the water trail. And I wanted uh, our co-presenter to get an opportunity to introduce herself, Sue. Hi, um, everybody, uh, Sue Thompson, um, board, Friends of the Rouge Board of Director, a long time uh, Friends of the Rouge uh, Bug Hunt team leader, and also during my day job is uh, helping with uh, doing coordinating monitoring um, for Wayne County, so we also partner with Friends of the Rouge to do um, the bug hunting that we're talking about tonight. Thank you, Sue. So uh, this uh, program is uh, a program put on by Friends of the Rouge and Friends of the Rouge has been around since 1986. And it's our mission to restore, protect and enhance the Rouge, Rouge River watershed through stewardship, education and collaboration. And we do that mainly through hands-on opportunities to clean up the river, to restore the river, and to monitor it. And also more recently, we are working on a little bit of recreation with a, with a paddling trail. So uh, the monitoring programs are a critical part of assessing the health of the watershed and tracking the, the restoration progress. And we really value your time um, and energy uh, put into this program by participating in these monitoring programs. You're actually participating in what's more commonly now called as citizen science. And uh, people are doing this all over the country, all over the world, uh, taking their time to, to monitor different things. And um, it's gotten to the point now where even uh, big agencies like the EPA, like NOAA, are recognizing the value of the contributions that volunteer citizen monitors make um, to uh, helping us to understand these natural systems. So um, you're, you're, you're not doing something small, you're, you're really contributing. So moving on to the next slide, if I can get this to work, there we go. So just a little bit of background on the Rouge River watershed. So Friends of the Rouge is focused on the entire watershed and it drains 467 square miles uh, covering parts of three counties, mainly Wayne and Oakland, and then a small part of Washtenaw County. The river is 125 miles and that's just in the, the four main branches, the main, the upper, the middle and the lower. Um, there's over 1.35 million people in the 48 communities that live in the watershed. And uh, the Rouge River is one of the most urbanized watersheds in the country. It also at one time, well, it's definitely Michigan's um, most urbanized river and also uh, Michigan's, one of Michigan's most polluted rivers. But it's also um, been called one of the rivers that has come the farthest uh, due to the massive federally, state, and locally funded efforts to clean up the river and the efforts of volunteers uh, like you. So just, uh, just to go over some of the reasons why, um, you know, the Rouge got so bad and still is, is a recovering watershed. Uh, and when you think about the problems that the river has, you know, number one, you know, you just think about the pollution. So we still do have issues with industrial waste, although, you know, a lot of that is now controlled and it's mainly legacy pollution. This picture right here would never be allowed today. Uh, we still have uh, problems with illicit uh, discharges and dumping, and Sue will talk a little bit more about that, about how you can help to expose that. And then um, a lot of people aren't aware of the combined sewer overflows that are still a problem in the Rouge. So in the older communities in the Rouge, 
uh, the systems were designed a long time ago to take the uh, waste from homes as well as what goes into the catch basins, put it into the same, combine it into the same system and then have it all go to the wastewater treatment plant. And that's great because that means the stormwater from the streets gets treated. But when it rains, uh, you need some so, sort of release valve so that that doesn't back up into people's homes. And that release valve has always been to go into the river. And so when these systems get overwhelmed, then we're putting diluted, um, but raw sewage, but diluted raw sewage into the river. And the Clean Water Act requires that the community stop doing this, and, um, but it's very expensive to come up with solutions. So a lot of the solutions are putting in gigantic basins uh, to hold the water uh, until it stops raining and, and screen it and maybe add some disinfectant, um, then put it back in the river, wait to send it to the wastewater treatment plant or separating some of the systems. So we are still in the process of addressing this. Um, most of our sites are not downstream of uncontrolled combined sewer overflows, um, but it is still a problem in some of the more downstream ends of the Rouge. And then stormwater pollution. 70 to 80 percent of the um, pollution in most urban rivers comes from stormwater pollution. So another issue is alteration of the river. Um, we have channelized the river. So back in the 70s, well, actually, even before the 70s, if you think about Zug Island, um, the Rouge River used to meander and come around what was not an island, and that was all marshland. So one of the original channelization projects was to dig a shortcut channel that created Zug Island down at the mouth by the Detroit River. And then since then, um, as the Ford Rouge plant was built along the banks and there was a need for shipping, and then uh, when there was a decision to build Fairlane Mall and there was a concern about flooding, in the 70s, the US Army Corps of Engineers decided to encase about 4.8 miles of the river in concrete. This is from uh, Michigan Avenue all the way down to the Ford Rouge plant. What a terrible thing to, the, to do to the river. You take away all of the habitat, you take away all those meanders and bends. And then, you know, we just have lots of parts of the Rouge where the channel has been straightened, whether it's concreteized or not. And then, you know, in addition, we alter it with dams. And even when you think about some of the road culverts, if they're too high, then when under low flow conditions, uh, they pose a barrier for fish. And then, um, you know, I mentioned the stormwater issue and, and really how we manage the land along the river. I mean, you can think about your own contribution to this. Basically, everything that we pave over, um, rooftops, streets, um, those parking lots, those all uh, are really detrimental to the river because the water, rainwater, stormwater no longer infiltrates and instead it runs off and we pipe it into the river very quickly. And so you think on one hand about all the pollutants that go into the river, the oils, the fertilizer, the pet waste, the road salt. Um, you think about how the water gets heated up, making it more difficult for fish that need high levels of dissolved oxygen that don't do so well when the water's warm. And then the second part of that is the Rouge River has so many impervious surfaces. In this map, the red areas are you know, almost up to 100% paved. So you can see as you go downstream, it gets worse. But you can also follow you know, the I-96 I corridor airports down here and you know the Detroit area that's the older communities that are more urban. Um, but the whole Rouge River is a very flashy system um, because we pipe the water off so quickly rather than infiltrating our river goes way up and then way down. So you probably saw that after the recent rain we had where now that I live on the river and um, you know there's certain times when I say I have lakefront property because that little bit of rain makes the river go way up and when a river goes way up and right way down you get a lot of erosion you get a lot of sediment in the water and it's very difficult for the fish and then of course the bugs that the fish eat to live. 
So we see this reflected in our um, benthic macroinvertebrate scores. When we do this monitoring, it actually will come up with a score for your site that will show you whether it's uh, fair, uh, which is the, the orange yellow dots, uh, good, the green, and poor. And uh, we recently did some analysis where if you look out in the um, Johnson Creek Northville area and some of the tributaries on the Lower Rouge, we have some of our better scores. Um, we recently had some uh, data analysis an analysts from Ford uh, look at increasing urbanization and forestation. And interestingly enough, they found that um, most of our built out communities actually are increasing a little bit in forestation but in the areas out on the outer perimeters of the watershed, we're actually getting, um, losing more forest and it's becoming more urbanized. And this is very concerning because that's some of the last remaining good quality habitat in the Rouge. There's a lot of development pressure out there. So uh, for our spring bug hunt, this is a map showing, um, showing all the sites that we're going to be going to. I guess I can't zoom in too much, but um, you should by now, if you're coming on Saturday, I've gotten your, your team assignments and I sent you a link to this map. So uh, every time we hold an event, we do a subset of the sites. Um, uh, and uh, this particular event is being funded mainly by the community. So all of these sites are sponsored, just about all of them are sponsored by the um, communities. So we talk about bugs, we call this the bug hunt because nobody really wants to talk about benthic macro invertebrates because those are really big words and they don't seem to mean too much to people. But as scientists, we like to define things specifically. So while we call these bugs in general, you really need to know technically what we're talking about. So we're talking about benthic. So these are animals that live in the stream bed. Uh, most of them don't really live in the water column. That's why when your team leader is out there, they're being very aggressive about knocking them off the rocks or off of the vegetation because they're adapted to living in fast moving streams. Macro, they can be seen without magnification. So while that might help, um, we're not looking for anything microscopic. Uh, when we were out there on Saturday, we did see these tiny little things called cyclo cyclops. Uh, they're interesting, but we're not really looking for those. We're looking for macro invertebrates, so it can be seen with the naked eye. And then lastly, animals without a backbone. So basically, we're looking at this whole community of um, aquatic insects. Those are the most sensitive ones. Um, and uh, other things like clams, snails, uh, crayfish, uh, mussels, uh, basically fish food. And why do we collect bugs? Well, people do this type of monitoring all over the country, all over the world. And um, in a way, it gives us more information than if we out, went out there and did you know, chemical monitoring, like looking, like testing dissolved oxygen levels or pH or temperature or um, nitrates, phosphates. Those kinds of tests give you a snapshot of that site in time. What's different about the bugs is that they live there full time. And some of them, like the dragonflies, they live as uh, nymphs in the stream for three years. And so if something goes wrong, they're not going to be able to survive there. So their presence there is a really good indication of the overall health of the stream at that site. So they're affected both by the chemicals, but also by the biological condition of the stream. It can be perfectly healthy water, but if you don't have riffles and pools and uh, overhanging vegetation, they won't be able to survive there. Most of these bugs, you know, they can escape pollution. Some fly, but not very long distances. Uh, so they're not going to be able to, to survive there if there's um, if the site is very polluted um, or if there's no habitat. They are a critical part of the um, stream's food web. And um, we look for, like, when, when we do the stonefly search, we're just looking for one type of aquatic insects. And all of the stonefly families are very sensitive. 
They need really clean water. Um, when we do the bug hunts, we're looking at the whole community. And we are looking for stoneflies, mayflies, caddisflies. Those are the really sensitive things. But we're also looking for the, the more tolerant things. We're looking at that whole community. And based on how many we find of each, we actually come up with a score based on if we find a lot of sensitive things like mayflies and other things like the crayfish, the dragonflies, the damselflies, the more that we find, the higher score that we have. And the more sensitive ones we find, the score is weighted that way. So um, bugs are fairly easy to train uh, I, uh, volunteers to sample for. Um, and if you're interested in becoming a team leader, we just started doing some training again after having to shut that down for COVID um, and learning how to sample. They're fairly easy to sample for. And they're fairly easy to learn how to identify. And we identify mainly to order out in the field, but then we also collect specimens and preserve them so that we can go farther and maybe identify them to um, family. I'm sorry, we mainly identify them to order. Like, is that a mayfly? Is that a damselfly? And then with the specimens, we might say, well, what type of damselfly is that? But that's something we do in the lab. Um, uh, and um, the equipment is really very inexpensive and um, you don't have to replace it that often, maybe a few pairs of waders and things. Um, and you can see we use things like plastic film trays and plastic spoons. Um, and uh, so they give you a good picture of the health of the site. If you don't find much at your site, you can think about things like, is there a lot of sedimentation, habitat loss or chemical pollution? So um, how do we collect them? Uh, this is actually one of our newer team leaders uh, showing us the um, riffle dance. So there's, there's various different techniques that you need to use. She's digging her toes into that riffle with her D-frame net just downstream. So ask your team leader to exhibit the, the riffle dance for you. And there's other techniques for overhanging vegetation, uh, pools, things like that. Um, See, if you are not a team leader, uh, you will be a picker or uh, you also can help to get the specimens. Your team leader will be in the water and it's always helpful if you can bring a tray over and let them dump uh, their, their net full of stuff into your tray. And then um, you'll be a picker. We do recommend that um, you bring a chair if you have one and even a little folding table. I always call these TV trays. Can be really helpful, especially if you have a, ba a bad back or such. We also supply uh, tarps that you can sit on. But um, because of COVID, we are trying to keep people as far apart as possible or just within their family group. So that's why we're recommending that you bring these things. And as a picker, it's your job to just look Look, look at that tray, look for things that are moving. You want a little bit of water in there and um, you just need to pick them out and we provide ice cube trays and just sort them out by like bug. Uh, so here's the sorting process. You can see they've sorted out some damselflies, dragonflies, uh, a little harder to see some sow bugs, things like that. Um, but it's a lot of fun to catch these things and we provide plastic spoons and little eyedroppers for some of the faster moving things. So here are some examples of what we you find out there. I'm sure you're familiar with crayfish. We have a lot of native crayfish. And if you see the number up in the corner of the slide, that just means the sensitivity. So we have three different categories. Number one for really sensitive things, two for somewhat sensitive and three for tolerant. So crayfish are, are a pretty good sign. Mayflies, category one. So mayflies have three tails. So do damselflies, but mayflies have really skinny tails. And then they have uh, gills on their abdomen. And you can actually see them flutter those around a bit uh, when they're alive. And um, that's one of the reasons that we would point to mayflies being very sensitive because if you have gills, you need to get your oxygen out of the water. So you need high levels of dissolved oxygen. So that water needs to be cold and it needs to be moving to, to hold oxygen. Here's a, a category two, so uh, somewhat 
uh, sensitive. So you might be familiar with dragonflies, the, the adult form, they hold their wings out, or damselflies that are similar, but they fold their wings over their back. They're, they're both related. You see they, they have a similar large head structure, uh, but the dragonflies just have a broad body uh, that doesn't really have tails, just sort of comes to some points at the end. Damselflies have a much longer, skinnier body, and like the mayflies, they have three tails, but they're paddle-shaped, not um, long and not skinny like the mayflies, and they don't have the abdominal gills. And then here's one that you commonly find at all sites. It's a category three midge larva, the little wrigglers. They're not actually worms, they're the larva of those little things that look like mosquitoes but don't bite. They have a fuzzy proboscis and you might walk into a whole cloud of them in spring when they're forming the towers, uh, the breeding to, to find mates. The, some are red, uh, some people call them bloodworms. Um, they're just midge larva and the red ones have a hemoglobin so that they can get oxygen from the water so they can tolerate really poor conditions. So um, just if you, all you find are red midge larva, that's not a good sign, but if you find a few, that's fine. So those are some of the bugs um, if you want to learn more there's a really wonderful site and i'm going to put it into uh, the chat right now let me see all for everyone um, it's called macroinvertebrates.org and it's a great place to explore all of these and you can even go through a quiz if you want to um, so uh, moving on, some other things that we all want to be on the watch for is uh, invasive species. And this program, through this program, we've actually um, been at the forefront of seeing some of these uh, invasions of things that really shouldn't be here in the watershed, but unfortunately they are. So uh, we noticed zebra mussels. Of course, they were down in the Detroit River and at the mouth, but they don't really go upstream. Unfortunately, they were found um, up in the middle branch. There's a lot of people that fish up there, so that's probably how they came in. And then we also found them in Seeley Creek. So the zebra mussels just, uh, they have that muscle shape, the, the, and they're pretty small. The ones in the rouge don't tend to be as brightly striped, uh, but they do have that shape, and they'll cover a lot of things. And then we also have another invasive clam, uh, the Asian clam, that has highly ridged uh, uh, ridges on the shell. Uh, and then in addition to those two um, mollusks, we also have some other critters, uh, just actually one of our team leaders who also does fish surveys for us was at an aquarium show and discovered a pond up in Novi that had the red swamp crayfish. These are the kind you get down in Louisiana, um, but they're extremely aggressive. They build huge burrows and destabilized banks. And that particular retention pond in Novi, I think the DNR at this point has trapped about 12,000 animals from that pond. That's how prolific they are. Um, huge problem. So keep a watch out for those. They're bright red, bright red bumps on the claws. And then in addition to that, uh, and you can see, Oh, those are just our fish sampling sites. I don't really uh, have the round goby, I mean the um, red swamp on this map. Uh, the round goby is an invasive fish uh, from um, the Russian area. Um, and they uh, moved up the lower, uh, they've been moving up the lower since we removed a dam and they're wiping out some of our native fish like the Johnny darters. Uh, we didn't have them up in the middle. We thought they couldn't get over the dam, uh, but then we found them up around the Nankin area. So they're in the middle now, and now they're moving up the main. Um, very, we're very concerned about their effect on some of our more sensitive species. So they have big bug eyes. They're quite ugly. Um, so I am going to turn this over to Sue, since you will be out at some sites where you might see things um, that that people don't see. And, and, you know, we talked about illicit discharges and um, we hope that you can help us in reporting these kinds of things so that you can get them taken, taken care of. As, as Sally's talked about um, pollution sources when she started the, uh, the presentation up, um, she did talk about 70% or so of um, pollution sources to the river are, are coming from uh, stormwater sources. Uh, and so one of the things that you'll be going out to sites with your team leader and also probably out on your day-to-day uh, -day activities 
um, there's some extra eyes and ears out there that can um, identify uh, suspicious things or things that are going on or entering in the river that, um, that uh, need to get reported. And what it says here, like in the picture, it says small discharges, um, if they continue day after day, they add, they add up. And when you think of the, how big um, the Rouge River watershed is of how many people live in it um, and all the different potentials for pollution sources. So it can definitely make a difference. Um, and Friends of the Rouge uh, volunteers have made a, a big difference in reporting illicit discharges when they've been out at sites. We've had, uh, we've had some bug hunt teams that, actually, uh, that encountered uh, active, um, active, um, active discharges, um, oil spills, um, and also some um, other, other um, sewage spills. And so things like that that got reported to the appropriate authorities um, to get repaired. So um, definitely are a big help. Um, next slide, please. Um, where pollution is concerned, as Sally talked about the uh, stormwater network, we have uh, so much impervious surface here in the Rouge River that um, you all recognize the storm drains out in front of your home there. And on a day, on a rainy day like we've had, um, that uh, those storm drains collect that water and any other material that's on that surface and it gets directly transported to our um, river or stream nearby without going to that that treatment plant um, it's not you know they're separated storm sewers not combined sewers um, so at that point so like the fish says you know soap is for dishes and, and not for fishes we want to keep those materials such as washing your car in the street changing your oil in the street things like that keep those materials off of our um, off of our roadways off of our lawns and that but it, it doesn't go directly out to our, our streams and rivers um, next and Sue, I'm getting a little feedback. I don't know if that's you. I think everybody else is muted, so it might just be. Okay, sorry about that. I'll move my microphone around. Hopefully this is better. Um, yeah, this, that's... This, um, is that better? A little bit. Okay. Um, the, these next series of slides, I'm not going to go into detail of all these, but what we want you to be aware of is if you do see something um, entering the river through a, a storm drain, um, or an outfall to um, the river um, is to recognize that yes, this shouldn't be there and to report it. Um, these few slides here, we show like the soil erosion, um, milk chocolate river after a rain, if uh, there's improper uh, soil erosion uh, control sites in place at a, um, at a construction site will be a big um, contributor to, to um, uh, sediment entering in the stream and in the water pollution there. We also have gray, gray uh, smelly, um, discolored um, discharges that are related to sewage, um, possibly from a from a, um, a sanitary sewer overflow or a failing septic system. And we have the greenish discharge going on there, just uh, if there's been fertilizing going on and it runs off into the river. Um, it creates um, an algae bloom when there's uh, way too much in there. Um, next, please. Other things is the, the famous uh, petroleum sheen, uh, the rainbow sheen that you see from a, a, a petroleum a discharge. And um, some of these, um, there could be some direct connections uh, from buildings into, into streams or rivers that uh, contribute pollution sources that way. Um, also, if you were to run across a fish kill um, where it looks like there's a lot of fish, and especially it's not when it's not right after a um, you know a freeze freeze thaw situation that we would see here in the in the winter, um, there could be some chemical or stress oxygen stress happening to the fish um, that uh, could be a situation going on that needs to get reported. Um, next, please. Um, just also too, as, as we talked about with the, the land uh, contributing to the storm sewer and things going into the river is, is uh, poor housekeeping and industrial sites. Uh, the, 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 the stuff gets into the, uh, the storm drains. And um, again, just uh, here's a picture of a, a spill that has happened here along the river that was, um, that was booed off to collect the um, petroleum product that's, uh, that was spilled into the river. Um, <clears throat> Okay, next, please. 
Uh, these, this is just a summary of some of the things that if you were to see um, out and about in your everyday activities is to, is to report. Um, a lot of our local units of government don't have a lot of, uh, a lot of eyes and ears out there. So the more things get reported to get taken care of um, is, is a great thing to have. If you are seeing someone actively dumping something, please do not approach them and say, stop, get as much information as possible, take a picture, take a video, call 911, um, you know, approach it that way. Um, and please, yeah, do not endanger yourself. Um, if you have any questions about what to report, please don't hesitate to contact Sally at Friends of the Rouge. And also, see, I do believe is sending out a link to a, a tip card, which goes into a little bit more detail about what some of these um, illicit discharges uh, look like, and then also where to report those. Um, next, please. Who do you call if you see these things? Like, uh, like I said, if you're not really sure what to report, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to uh, to Sally at Friends of the Rouge, and she can she can help direct you. But um, Eagle uh, has a, has the P's, the 24 hour per, uh, pollution emergency alert system. Also, uh, the three counties in this um, in this uh, southeast Michigan area. Uh, there is 24-hour hotlines and folks at these agencies that do go out um, when they do receive uh, uh, calls about illicit uh, discharges, they are, uh, they are actively investigated. So, so when there is things reported, they are looked at. So that's appreciated to have um, report anything that you may see or, or encounter that uh, you think needs to be investigated. So thanks. And thank you for volunteering to help um, Friends of the Rouge um, do the volunteer monitoring and um, collect for bugs, but also also get trained to be some extra eyes and ears. Thank you so much, Sue. Uh, Sue is such a great resource. She actually uh, does this for a living where she goes out and investigates things like this. So um, feel free to, to, to contact her. Um, and I, uh, I did put into the chat both a link to a brochure about what to report as well as a link to uh, a, a card that looks similar to this that has those um, phone numbers on them. And um, just in case you think that this isn't a problem, um, and uh, I want you to be aware of these things even outside of the bug hunt. One of our bug hunt team leaders actually woke up one morning and took a look at the creek outside his uh, in his backyard and it had turned bright green. And uh, he called me immediately. And of course I instructed him to call the hotline. Uh, it turned out to be that somebody was doing some dye testing to see uh, how a house was connected. And then the process discovered that the uh, sewage line from the house was going directly into the river, but they put a little bit too much dye in there. Um, but anyway, um, the fact that Bill was trained, he knew who to call. We got this reported to the start state right away and it got taken care of. So just keep that in mind and keep those uh, brochures and numbers by you, stick it on your fridge or put it in your cell phone. I would suggest that you do that. So um, I wanted to show you the scores from last year. Unfortunately, last year, uh, if you recall uh, how the pandemic uh, was un See, I unmuted myself. Um, we were unable to hold the spring bug hunt because uh, we were under a stay at home order and I couldn't ask people to even go travel out as volunteers. Uh, so I'm showing you the scores from 2019 and um, we were actually uh, had some funding issues. So we didn't do quite as many sites, but you can still see uh, that pattern where our healthiest sites are out in the headwaters. Um, most of the sites in the Rouge are fair. And then we actually have quite a few low scores. Uh, these sites usually score a little bit higher. So uh, like I said earlier, the spring um, bug hunt, we've struggled a bit for funding because a lot of the funding that Friends of the Rouge used to get is going towards projects, not towards monitoring, because there's a lot of emphasis by the federal government on boots on the ground projects. But if you're gonna do a good project, if you're gonna do a successful project, you need to monitor before and after to know whether that project is doing what you said it would do and to figure out where the projects need to go. So it's really important. Um, this year, we actually were, were we, for the last couple of years, we've been looking for sustainable funding. And since we sample in these communities and they benefit from the data, we ask if they would sponsor sites. So 
Um, all of these communities here and uh, the County of Wayne are sponsoring sites and this program is also supported through uh, memberships and donations. So COVID protocol. Um, yes, it's a little bit different this year. Um, we cannot make this event risk-free, but we can do everything in our power to reduce the risk of the transmission of COVID. And I thought at this point in time, um, things would be really be uh, loosening up, but unfortunately, um, we are the only state in the country that's, that has such high levels of COVID. So it's, it's a big concern. But on the other side, um, studies have found that outdoor events in small groups with socially distanced, with people fully masked, um, can be relatively safe. So uh, you all had to fill out the health screening and we do ask you to ask those questions um, that morning. If you have any sort of fever or um, were exposed or whatever, please just excuse yourself and do not come. Um, so that's one level. Secondly, we require masks even though you're outdoors, but you might get a little bit closer accidentally at some point to people. So please wear those masks and make sure that they cover your nose. Uh, you'll get a Friends of the Rouge one to help with that. Um, a lot of people are double masking now and we do recommend that. Um, number three, maintain that social distancing, uh, distancing. So bring a chair so you can sit sort of separately. Sometimes we bring tables, but we do find that, um, you know, unless you're working with your family group, you want to stay far apart. Um, and, you know, wash your hands when you're done. We do provide some hand sanitizer. Um, but uh, if we follow all of these protocols, and we also, you know, are making sure to track whoever has signed up and whoever does attend. So in the event that there is uh, some sort of exposure that we can notify, you can notify us right away and we can notify everybody else. Um, but let's do everything that we can to stay safe so that uh, in a couple of years from now, we can, we can actually meet together. Um, so uh, if you enjoy the event, please consider going through training. Uh, we're doing that partially virtually, kind of figuring out how to do that partially in the field. This is from our field training on Saturday. Uh, so being a team leader means you need to be available for, um, you know, most of the events, the spring and fall bug hunts and the stonefly search. And um, we, we, you know, uh, assign you with another person for a few events until you're comfortable and usually try to assign you with another person um, to lead the team. But this program would not be possible without people that are willing to go through the training and then lead a team. Uh, we have uh, 12 teams that are actually 13 teams that are going out on Saturday. Um, and if you are not already a member of Friends of the Rouge uh, to help uh, us to continue to be able to offer events like this, we uh, highly suggest that you join Friends of the Rouge. Uh, you can give a donation to support this program. Um, our website is therouge.org. Um, so that is the uh, end of the formal presentation. So um, if you need to go, that's fine. We did this in 40 minutes, so not too bad. Um, I do see that there is one question. Um, and, uh, and if you have any other questions, well, the one question here comes from uh, Gabrielle. Uh, and her question is, do people emptying swimming pools into the creeks flowing to the Rouge cause problems? So Sue, do you, do you want to address that one? Yeah, um, I can uh, feel that one. Um, that question, it depends. If, um, if someone is emptying your pool, like for the cleaning at the beginning of the season, um, or at the end of the season, um, and they're discharging water to, uh, from the pool into the river or to a storm drain, uh, the DEQ advises that the chlorine or any cleaning materials that are left in that pool that it, that it be dechlorinated. Um, if that water is discharged and then not to use any any um, nasty the, the chemicals are in there, harsh chemicals that that are used to clean the pool. But otherwise, if it sits, if it sits to let the chlorine and those those materials. Uh, uh, dissipate, then um, then you are safe to discharge it into um, offsite. 
Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> so uh, if there are no more questions, then we're going to call it a night. So I just want to thank you again for volunteering. Uh, I also did want to point out that Friends of the Rouge has a lot of other things going on. Uh, we will add you to get our um, bi-monthly e-newsletter so you can get updated. We have our Rouge Rescue Cleaning Cleanup coming up May 15th. We have all kinds of projects, uh, installing rain gardens, uh, doing restoration projects. Um, it's a little too late to sign up for the frog and toad survey. I know a lot of you who do this uh, also do the survey, but sign up next year or start to learn your calls. Um, and uh, we also are going to be doing some fish surveys, so there might be some opportunities there if you're interested. So uh, like I said, you should have received your assignment uh, for where you're meeting your team on Saturday. It's a good idea to, to bring snacks, something to drink, um, you know, wear clothes that can get dirty, dress for the weather, should be pretty nice, unusually. Um, cell phone, camera, I always really appreciate pictures uh, of people. Uh, during COVID, we prefer all the pictures be people masked and socially distanced because we want our pictures to reflect our protocol. Um, but love, uh, love if you get those because I cannot get out to the sites and we just like to use them in presentations like this. Um, we also have a Facebook page. Feel free to post them up there um, and talk about what you find. Um, so again, thank you so much for participating in our citizen science programs and um, hope you have a lot of fun on Saturday and that you find a whole lot of bucks. Thanks. Have a wonderful evening.